All right, it is 7.02. We will get this started. Good to see everybody. Uh, so just in terms of remote meeting procedures and keeping with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations, this meeting will be conducted remotely over Zoom. Attendance by board commission members will be remote and remote attendance shall count toward quorum. The meeting may be broadcast live and will be recorded on ECAT. Uh, so we are good for that. Let's take a roll call, make sure who we have here. Benson present. Hi, Al. How are you? Doing good. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Uh, so we have Al Benson. Uh, if you could just say I when I call your name, that would be great. Uh, Ed Hands. Here. John Ventresco. Aye. Greg Strange. I think he said Greg he will not be. Yeah, be he's. Out. He's got a terrible thing called a wedding in Italy, I believe. Yep. Um, and I think Jim Lee also will not be, be here tonight. Uh, Dennis Sheedy. Here. Uh, Amanda Varela. Hi. Meredith Teach. Here. And Tom Broussard is here as well. Awesome. Thank you all. Good to see you all again. Uh, tonight we have on our agenda looking at our July 14th minutes. And then we have the letter of interest phase which uh, just as a reminder, uh, at our last meeting, we looked at those items that were related to what I'll call parks and recreation. And it was to help those people that have submitted a letter of interest know, at least in this initial, our, our uh, gauge of whether they should proceed and file an official application or not. Um, all of the items last week did go to the official application phase. Again, going to that phase does not mean it's a yes for us. It just means we'll get their official application work with them to finish it, and then we'll come back and have debate about that at a future meeting. So I guess I call this the the, um, the, the preamble, so to speak. Um, so let's, uh, I guess, get to the minutes first. Hopefully everybody had some time to review the minutes from July 14th. Did anybody, before I ask for a motion, have any questions, thoughts, or uh, items they wanted to discuss? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to accept the regular session minutes of July 14th. So moved. Second. That's Hans and Ventresco, and I'll take a vote going around the horn, top to bottom. Uh, Ed Hans. Aye. John Ventresco. Aye. Al Benson. Aye. Amanda Varela. Aye. Meredith Keach. Abstain. Dennis Sheedy. Aye. And Tom Broussard is an I as well. Perfect. All right, so we get to move on. First up in terms of the letter of interest is for the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, we have the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust, Nikki Dostumian joining us. Nikki, thank you so much. I know if I recall correctly, you are actually on vacation. So I appreciate you taking time to join us and bring us up to speed on all the goings on for the Affordable Housing Trust. I think this year's uh, number is the obligatory amount that we uh, have to give according to CPA rules, but appreciate you joining and just chatting with us about what's going on in your world. I know you're off mute, Nikki, but we can't hear you. Now, I think you muted your... Is there the infamous double mute going on somehow? I, Nikki and I spoke on the phone um, briefly just before the meeting, and she has terrible, terrible reception. Um, so she may not have enough bandwidth to make this happen, but I think she'll keep trying for a little bit and then maybe have to hand it off to me. But let's give it another minute. Shout out, Nikki. Credit for trying. All right, Wayne, do you want to give us an update for Nikki struggling? Sure thing. Yeah, oh. sorry about that. Um, happy to. audio. Yeah. Nope. Don't know audio from Nikki? Oh, well. Um, well, I, I've also got her on text. So if I say something wrong, Nikki, please correct me and I'll uh, make sure I get it right. Um, 
Yeah, so as, as you mentioned, Tom, this is the 10% uh, um, set aside for community housing request, similar to last year. We imagine it'll be about 200,000. Uh, the um, exact number won't be known until later uh, in spring uh, when the town accountant gets the numbers in for the state and such. Um, we are currently in the process of doing a five-year action plan with Old Colony that will identify specific projects and associated budgets for us. Uh, we've done that in the past. Uh, some longer-term members may remember uh, several years ago that was uh, we had an action plan. Um, things we're doing right now, some exciting updates. Uh, you may remember the affordable um, group housing uh, project at 300 Foundry Street. That's for eight bedrooms with individuals with acquired uh, brain injuries. And they've got their certificate of occupancy. Uh, so the project is virtually finished and uh, they're hoping to um, start moving residents in later this spring. So that would be exciting. Um, Nikki, you wanna try one more time, Nikki? Am I in? Can anybody hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay, um, the live music just started and I'm on the beach, so I'm so sorry. I wish I was in a better spot right now, but I'm not. And Wayne, thank you for picking up where um, I kind of dropped off. Are you, uh, were you just about to talk about the, um, our recent project, Wayne? Yeah, I talked about the 10% request and I gave a quick update on 300 Foundry, but I haven't touched on a couple of the other things we're doing right now. Okay, so we're um, currently working with Old Colony Planning Council on a five-year action plan um, so we can identify some um, upcoming projects and programs and associated budgets. Um, we also have just received um, an advantageous proposal from Social Habitat for Humanity for um, the um, for up to three units of affordable family housing. Um, one at 26 Bequanicate, which we acquired for $235,000 um, and up to two at 10 Morse Road for um, that we acquired um, for $220,000. Can you guys hear me? I'm so sorry. We can. All um, good. And these are these were both acquired um, right before the pandemic. Um, so we um, are, our, our subshore Habitat for Humanity is asking for a $70,000 grant for um, 35 for each parcel. And that would bring the Affordable Housing Trust to approximately uh, $525,000 investment to um, get three affordable, hopefully three affordable family homes, which is really awesome. Um, we also have um, invested $30,000 over the last um, year um, through Old, Count, Old Colony Planning Council also for an updated housing production plan, which was recently accepted by the state in late June, and that's good for five years, so we are um, good through June, the end of June 2027. Um, and these are just a couple of the projects we're currently working on. Um, and I could go on, but I feel like I'm, I'm going a little fast and it's probably not great quality, but. No, it's all good. It's appreciated. Just uh, a thank you for taking the time to join um without question and appreciate all that you folks are doing so i know that this is the as wayne pointed out the obligatory amount that we have to do but certainly would look forward to learning from you as you build out your five-year action plan how the cbc may play a role in supporting that given this is one of the primary um, items of consideration that the cpa fundamentally provides for so certainly look forward to working with you and your team in the future in times to come That would be great. We would look um, forward to um, having this be just an intro discussion and um, more to come. Perfect. Hopefully Meredith, I think you had your hand raised. Yeah, just curious, only because I was asked just recently where uh, the status of the Bequanicate uh, property is at. 
So that's the one, that's one of the two parcels that um, we just received advantageous proposals from, uh, a, in advantageous proposal from, from South Shore Habitat for Humanity. Um, and we are moving forward with um, that proposal and um, looking forward to working with Social Habitat for Humanity again um, in the past to develop that into a, um, a, an affordable family home. Um, Wayne, maybe you can speak to the more technical terms of the um, actual stage in the process we're in. I don't want to misspeak. Oh, sure. No, that, that is true. Um, so uh, the trust has received and recommended um, that the select board approve uh, transferring 10 Morse and 26 Waconica to South Shore Habitat for Humanity. We are on the select board's agenda for August 22nd, um, and then we'll uh, move to closing and such uh, and hope to transfer them out by this fall. And also, um, 26 Waconica became rather overgrown in the last year or so. So we did hire a landscape firm to clean up the property, do some mowing and tidy it up. So it's a little uh, more sightly um, as it waits for the uh, vacant structure to get removed and uh, a new house to be built. Will um, uh, Habitat for Humanity handle the demolition of that yes. uh, house? Yeah, oh, that's so, great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and one of the reasons for that, um, partly it's uh, less costly to the town, um, yeah. which is a big important reason. And then also the lot is very slightly undersized. It's, it's a good size lot, but technically it's a little bit small. So you keep the current non-conforming structure standing while you get your approvals to replace it with a less non-conforming um, structure. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's for, for, for permitting purposes, you need to keep it in place until you get your approvals for the replacement house. Nice, thank you. You bet. Perfect. Thank you, Wayne. You bet. Anything else for Nikki or Wayne regarding the Affordable Housing Trust? All right. Hearing none, Nikki, thank you so much. I know, again, it wasn't the most convenient way for you to call in, but it's appreciated. Thank you so much for your uh, consideration. And um, um, hopefully next time I'll be in a little bit of a better position to talk more. Thank you, you guys. Welcome, Matt. You did great. Yep, you sure did. Have a great vacation. <coughs> Bye. Bye now. All right. So I think um, from this perspective, again, I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't, I can't recall if our last meeting we took votes to recommend that we move to the application phase. But I think in this particular case, unless there are any questions, there, there really can't be, but that we would move the affordable housing trust into the application phase as we normally would each year. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, next up, we have the Ames Library, Ames Free Library, uh, Quisit Garden Walls. And for that, I think we have Ian joining us. Ian, Hi, yes. Here? Yes, thank you for having me. Perfect, thank you for joining us. Uh, nice to see you. I know we haven't met in person, but uh, appreciate what you do over there at the Ames Free Library on all of Thank our you. collective behalf, and I do look forward to meeting you in person. Um, so just by way of explanation for the rest of the audience, um, this is certainly at the library at the Cuisa Garden. The category falls under historic <laughs> preservation. The lead contact will be Ian. So mm -hmm. again, I appreciate that you are here. Uh, the total estimated cost of this project, Ian, I believe is $250,000. And we are here for a potential letter of interest regarding a CPA contribution in the amount of $85,000. So Ian, since we have you live and they probably wanna hear your voice far more than mine, so I won't read, but do you mind just giving us an update on the, the ask, the project and kind of what you're looking to accomplish overall? Uh, yes, of course. Um, the, the west end of Quisit Garden um, was originally the shed for maintaining the garden of Quisit House um, back in the 19th century. Um, right now, it's just um, disrepaired masonry, um, walls without roofs, crumbling walls. Um, we've had to bar barricade some of it up to keep people out of it. Um, so the intention is to just go in there, um, restore the best as we can the original shed, 
um, to use it to actually house what the original purpose, um, tools and equipment to maintain the garden, um, and well as uh, repair the walls, um, because people are over there using it just for safety concerns, um, loose and crumbling masonry. Um, so while we're in there, we're hoping um, basically to offer more usable space um, for guests using the garden itself, um, installing um, some benches um, after the letter of intent, the board um, threw on the ideas of some covering for shade, especially in this heat wave we've had in the summer. Um, we've had all of our story times and stuff out there for COVID to keep it outside. Um, and they basically have to try to find what shade and location they can to make sure everyone is comfortable. And we are hoping this will just be a little bit more um, useful for smaller groups. So Ian, if you don't mind just at least orienting me, where, uh, where, would, the, where would this be? Okay, so if you um, move your mouse uh, like an inch to the left, you can actually see the, the walls, yes. So okay. that one right corner is the one in question right now. Um, the trees kind of hide it. Um, but there is basically just, um, uh, yeah, um, right there. And then behind the tree, there is a little bit more of what the shed would be, would be right there, yes. Sure. So right now it's just crumbling walls. So for the actual shed, um, one full wall will need to be, um, no, all four walls will need to be repaired and a roof will need to be installed, um, as well as a door, um, electricity, um, everything just to keep it, you know, buildable and usable at this point in time. And what's that structure, um, Wayne, is that you with the mouse pointer? That's yeah, right. right where it's pointed there. What is that there? So that is um, the equivalent. Um, it's the, basically the same idea. It was, I believe, a carriage house. Um, right, if the very bottom of the screen, there was an old like garage a door right there um, that goes through right now, which is overground and, and basically a swamp. Um, that is more of a, a long term plan. Um, once this is going is to try to do what we can to restore that. Um, but we want to start um, above that because it's an area that people are actually using now. Um, and make that more friendly, more usable, safer route, and then expand it downwards. So is there any plan, because I know I'm forgetting the last leader of the library, because I had walked with her at one point, mm -hmm. there was one day where she was particularly concerned about, um, because you can access where you go up in between the, those two, that's yes. kind of the little corridor, and, and kids were going up there and coming yep. back around on top and jumping down, and she was concerned one for them jumping down and that the structure there was crumbling. And so they, the library was looking at sort of taping it off or doing something. Is that is that something that still is a hazard or has that been addressed? I apologize, it, I haven't been back there in a bit. No, no, it's, it's quite all right. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, it is still a hazard, just like everything else. Um, we did rope it off, but like anything else, I mean, people just took the rope off. I actually, at this point, it was a, a chain and it just shattered and I'd find pieces of it around. It was just a plastic chain. Um, I don't know if it was landscapers or, or teenagers, but it, it didn't last. Um, it was more for the visual appeal. Um, so there were less jumping into it. Um, jumping in, I think even a, a teenager would be wary of because it's probably like eight to 10 feet um, down and it's not pleasant down there. Um, a lot of stones and, and wood and other things that would hurt. I think they're more work more concerned because they would just walk along the edge of the wall. Um, and like I said, it's not in a good con it's just not in a good condition for that. Um, but the garden is heavily used by the public and you know kids run free. <laughs> um, so it is um, something we are concerned about. Um, as I said, we did attempt to rope it off and we'll we keep on trying and it keeps on coming down. Um, but it's just focusing on the the section I'm in question is is basically in the same state. Um, there's less to like fall into. Yeah, you can kind of see it better there. Um, but it is just crumbling masonry with the hill behind it that we've actually restored a little bit um, for another usable space too. So now there's people above these walls that could easily um, walk down onto them. In fact, I saw some over there earlier today. Thank you. You're welcome. Ed? 
uh, I was back there fairly recently uh, in June with uh, with fourth graders, and yet they do indeed walk on that uh, that stuff, and it is dangerous down below. The down below part was where the horses were kept, and uh, if you go up that ramp. Uh, and quite a ways back into the woods, there's a, the, the, the back wall. The, the carriage house there was quite large at one point. Uh, I just, just wanted to point that out. Thank you. I have a question for Ed. Um, piggybacking on what we discussed, if I'm recalling correctly, last time. How much of the current site is, is restored in a historically accurate way? And because you and I both had a little bit of a negative reaction to a second stage, if I'm recalling correctly. To the best been... of my knowledge, uh, none of the area is actually restored historically. Okay. Uh, there was a limited amount of uh, Olmstead landscaping uh, related to the uh, uh, second mansion that's no longer there. Uh, and that's, that's long gone. And... Um, the original garden at Quisset House, um, the one closest to the house was redone by um, Forest Systems when they owned the property or leased the property. And then um, the, um, the area uh, where we have story time and, and music and all of that sort of stuff was restored in a um, similar fashion to what it was, but a lower maintenance version. So uh, instead of having a million gardeners taking care of flowers, uh, the hope there was that um, uh, the greenery would uh, would suffice. But yeah, you're right. Some of the uh, some of the privet has already died over there. So. And Ann, uh, oh, go ahead. sorry, I was thinking about the stage specifically. Yeah, sorry, Ian, could you talk a little bit about the stage? So. You know, some of um, the questions that were raised on a prior um, meeting for the CPC did wonder about how the new stage would come into play. Do we need more uh, stage area, mm -hmm. for example? So if you could help us understand what this new stage would add an additional value that might not already exist on site, that might be helpful. Yeah, of course. That is a completely legitimate question. Um, so I think... Stage may not be the most appropriate word for it, but it's the best I can come up with. Um, the stage in Pergola we have now is, is wonderful. It's a great asset to the library. It is used for um, concerts and performances um, and stuff like that. But we do have, um, specifically for like our story times, um, they've been outside for the last two years um, for safety concerns. Um, and they use the stage, but they only use um, like the west corner of it because there's generally shade over there in the morning. Um, the rest of it, it's kind of um, too expansive almost for just small kids. Um, and outside of our own needs, um, there's a lot of community use in terms of just uh, photographers for families or um, graduates and stuff like that. Um, and again, they um, will use it there, but they only they don't need the full thing. It's a little bit too imposing almost for that use. So what we're proposing, again, a stage is the best word I can come up with but it would be just a fraction of the size. Um, you know, maybe less than a, the foot off the ground, just like three or four feet um, to the side. Basically at the very top of the screen, um, where against the wall, just um, maybe like a, a half of an inch now behind the tree. Um, and, and at this scale, like um, against the, the, yeah, the top corner, right? Yeah, right about there, just something very small um, uh, something big enough for just you know one, maybe two people to stand on and just present um, as a natural focus. Um, we're hoping to put some uh, benches um, east of that down below facing it and maybe some sort of awning above. So it's less a stage and more of just a platform to focus attention and um, so we can have um, smaller lectures, um, a more personal um, story time feeling. Um, another avenue for people just to take photos um, and make use of the space. Um, so not like a, a grand stage taking up um, the whole area with uh, to the whole scale. Thank you. That's very helpful. That addressed my concern entirely. <laughs> Perfect. You're Any other welcome. questions from the team? Uh, you need to come up with a better word than, than stage. Yes. Uh, uh, 
clearly it's a it's a small group mm -hmm. performance area or something like that. Yep. Uh, and I think that would that would sell it better. Yeah, okay. Story time area, nook, something story time area. stage. I had a yep. very visceral reaction to. Yep. Even though I Absolutely. recognize the the limitations of the gargantuan stage that's there now, <laughs> but yeah, something more intimate mm -hmm. and and because I think people, if Ed and I both had that reaction, like, well, wait, what do you mean a second stage? Just because the other one's too big. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, it's, um, I, I definitely understood it. I was kind of worried about that in the first place, but I guess I, I should have pulled out my source and came up with another word. Um, I mean, just for one example, um, a year or so ago, I had a, um, during kind of the, not the height of COVID, but actually when everything was shut down, I had a single performer play on um, the existing stage. And because it was COVID, I only, I had less than a dozen people come out for it. He did a wonderful job. Um, but it's just like one person sitting down in a school with one amplifier playing like an acoustic guitar to like half, you know, less than a dozen people out in that whole garden. It just, um, it spread everything out too much. Um, I think it, it kind of lost the appeal almost. So that's when uh, I noticed like, oh, we do need something a little bit more intimate for settings of those natures. Um, so that is more, uh, so Uma Hremis was an existing director. That was kind of her vision. My concern coming into there is actually just the safety of the masonry and the wall there to get those um, restored um, in a usable position because people are there um, regardless. Like I said, we block them off. They, they still go over there. Um, they're being used. Um, and I'm just concerned that something's going to crumble underneath of the foot. Yeah. Uh, any last questions for Ian? All right. Um, any issues with us um, moving this particular item on to an official letter of application uh, so that we can consider it along with all the other items that move to that phase in terms of uh, items that we may consider funding? All right. Hearing none, Ian, thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to getting your official application. You've got some great folks to work with. We're always available throughout the process as well if you have questions. The town, Wayne and Stephanie are incredible resources as well to help shepherd you through the application process and give you some good words of advice like replacing the word stage with <laughs> intimate nook, all those other good things um, and, and, and a lot more uh, than that. So thank you for everything that you do for our town and community, Ian. Again, nice to meet you and we look forward to chatting with you in the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for um, giving me the opportunity to speak um, and I look forward to meeting you in person as well. Awesome, Ian. Have a great night. Thanks again. Thank you. You too. All right. Thanks, team. Uh, next up, we have the town hall landscape. Um, I don't see Greg Swan on unless there's a page two. So Wayne or Stephanie, will you speak to this on behalf of the town? Matt, Matt Groshield. I, I cannot pronounce Matt's last name. I apologize. I've been trying for months now. Um, Matt is the town engineer and works with Greg Swan and is covering while Greg's on vacation. Oh, good for Greg. Hey, and Matt, thank you so much for taking time out of your day uh, and coming and joining us this evening to help us understand that. And maybe you can help Stephanie and I would hazard a guess several more of us be able to pronounce your last name correctly. <laughs> yes, uh, it's Matt Groshaw with uh, the Department of Public Works. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Um, so thank you for uh, taking the time to hear what we're uh, asking for. We're looking to uh, re um, receive uh, $60,000 um, to create a master plan for the gardens and the grounds around the town hall. As you're all aware, we've done and been doing numerous projects at the town hall. Uh, most currently, we're replacing windows um, and doing some roof repairs and, ex and other exterior repairs. Uh, one of the other things that we've recently done is we've taken all the downspouts um, around the building um, and channelized those and get, move them away from the building. Uh, we were having some drainage in the water and intrusion problems in, in the basement. So we had to dig up around the building to put some underground uh, piping to get all that uh, rainwater away from the building. Uh, one of the things we're going to be looking to do in the future also is replace the septic system at Town Hall. So uh, once we get all these uh, utility improvements done, what we like to do is um, hire a landscape architect to kind of create a master plan for the grounds of the town hall. 
uh, to give us some direction as to what we could do out there to improve it and try to restore it to what it, what it used to be. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know too much about plants and all that stuff. Uh, so we'd be looking for some guidance from a, an experienced landscape architect so that it has um, experience in restoring historic grounds and, and the like. So the idea would be for them to create some sort of master plan um, of the grounds. We have um, have them look at the existing documentation of the area. Uh, we have some public input uh, workshops to get some input from the public uh, and then prepare some concept plans uh, that we can all kind of look at and discuss and try to come up with one one final uh, master plan to go forward with that. And and the idea would be to try to use town force the town DPW um, has a lot of very talented people that can do a lot of, of, of the work that we're looking to do. Uh, so that would be a cost benefit to the town uh, as opposed to having all that stuff get out and subbed out. So that's kind of generally what we're looking for um, in, in terms of this project. Awesome. Matt, thank you uh, for that update. Team, any questions for Matt? I just had a couple of basic questions, Tom. Please do. Uh, so according to the application, if I understand right, the landscaping is going to be a mixture of the old researching what it was like back then and then incorporating some new ideas and you're going to be blending that together. That's the, my first question. The second question, and if I heard you correctly, the gazebo will be incorporated into this in the gardens in that area. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. But that's kind of the whole idea is to bring all this stuff together into, into one cohesive kind of concept and uh, tie it all back together to what it used to be, but also incorporate some new, uh, new modern stuff into it also. Ed? Um, I guess I'm going to ask the question that John usually asks, uh, and I have one of my own. Uh, the first question is, uh, the original garden required a tremendous amount of maintenance. Uh, have you given any consideration to the uh, long-term maintenance of this? Yeah, a, a little bit. And that's also where I think the landscape architect will help us um, pick out the, the right kind of uh, stuff to put in, in here that might be a little more uh, uh, tolerant or, or less maintenance requirement than that. And I would uh, direct you to the historical society because a lot of the there's a there's a plot plan a big scale plot plot plan um, of uh, the whole grounds including the the vegetable gardens and things that you're hopefully not going to be restoring. Uh, and then my my question is um, uh, why a gazebo? Yeah, you want to take that one, me? Say what? Uh, Wayne, Wayne had his hand up. I... Yeah, go ahead, Wayne. Hi there. Um, they're not proposing to install a gazebo. Um, I believe John was talking about the wellhead, the decorative wellhead that's off. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah, and we're hoping that we'll have enough money in the current project to restore the stonework. We're still getting some estimates on that. Um, so there's a good chance we might be able to uh, get it rehabbed uh, now, this fall. And if not, then it would certainly be rolled into um, this uh, landscape project. Is that going to be CPC funds also? Which? To restore that? If it's part of this current project, yeah. It was, it was um, spec'd as a part of the original project back in 2020. It's part of um, Spencer's original, um, uh, you know, plan uh, for that. That this whole current project is based on. I'm but amazed. Sandy, I'm sorry, Tom. No, I just want to make a point of order, perhaps, or just ask a question. So we are currently looking at, in this particular case, supporting the creation of a master plan. That I want to make sure that doesn't therefore mean we're in any way, shape, or form obligated. To contribute to any future facets, those would be separate and additional asks, and I, I think that's just important 
a for me to clarify that that's how I think of it and that our team looks at it that way. I see a lot of head nods Absolutely. and to make sure those people that ask for funds look at it that way as well so that they don't presume the approval of support of a master plan, for example, in this case would therefore necessitate our support for any other future development that should be on the responsibility of the people or bodies that are asking. So I think we're all on the same page on that. Meredith? You're still muted. That button is stuck. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Matt, I just wanted to, as you're in the planning phases, if it gets to that, to let you know that um, the Recreation Department hosts their annual egg hunt in the field in front of um, the house every year. Um, so it's really great to be able to have children running around the front there. So if that could kind of be something in the back of your mind that, you know, once a year that that's a location where, you know, the kids can play, that would be great. The um, other thing to consider is there's a, some kind of restriction in the deed about structures uh, between the, the building and the stone wall. And I can see Wayne shaking his head. So the historical commission knows about that. Good. And I see that we have the world famous Jim Lee has joined us. Jim, how are you, sir? I, I'm late, the late Jim Lee. <laughs> I apologize. Really, still world famous, no problems at all. For some reason, I thought that you um, actually might not be able to make tonight, Jim. So no worries. I'm mostly here. <laughs> I appreciate that. So for the record, Jim's joined and participate in votes going forward. Any other questions for Matt? Hearing none, does anybody have any reservations why we wouldn't at least let this particular letter of interest proceed to the next phase for an official um, application? All right, hearing none. Matt, thank you for filling in. You did so ably. We will uh, definitely vouch for you with Greg when he gets back from his vacation. And um, it was nice to meet you, even if virtually. And thanks for everything that you do for the town. And uh, please pass along our best to the team. Great, thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Perfect. Uh, so next up on our agenda, we have the Governor Ames Carriage House. And are we fortunate enough to have some folks that can join us and let us know a uh, status update on that particular request? Yes. Can you hear me? We got you, Bob. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Bob Murray. I'm with the Trustees of Reservations, and I am the project director for the trustees that works on projects across the state. Uh, with me tonight is um, Peter Morata, who is the new uh, portfolio director for the Ames Estate. So, um, so uh, can I give you a brief overview of uh, the yeah, project? Please do. So, um, we uh, acquired the property, as you well know, in uh, 2012, and we've been uh, working on investing on uh, making the property more accessible to the public, you know, creating uh, parking areas and improving circulations, um, but also investing in resource protection of the historic and scenic features that define the character of the property. Um, and as we have worked to fully activate the property, we found that one of the limiting factors we've uh, come into is uh, not having a proper gathering spot uh, to help support programming on the property. And over the years, we've looked at a, a lot of different alternatives. Um, and uh, we, it was last fall that we hired a, an architectural firm to help us with the planning of that. And um, so the basis of our project, there's sort of uh, two uh, key phases to it. So the first one is uh, the removal of the ex existing residence and putting in its place a um, seasonal tent uh, that would be sort of a platform for uh, community programming on, on the site. Um, the second phase of this project would be uh, making renovations to the historic carriage house um, that would um, provide support uh, to this uh, new uh, event space uh, in the form of 
uh, upgraded systems and um, accessible bathrooms uh, to the site. And, um, and then additional, uh, some improvements to the landscape there to ensure that we protect the integrity of that landscape and uh, work to sort of enhance that with these uh, new uh, improvements. Awesome. So that's kind of a quick um, uh, sort of overview of it. You know, our objectives are to create a, um, a flexible community gathering space for programs and events, but not only for that, but for uh, casual uh, visitors as well that can uh, seek shelter, you know, from the, the, the heat, sun, um, rain, uh, and will help us in programming our events there as well. Um, and then a partial renovation of the, the carriage house, which I think is uh, the focus of this group. Um, we're trying to save as much of the original um, features of the carriage house. So the keeping the horse stalls and other elements and trying to be very thoughtful on um, the proposed renovation. And, um, and the exterior of the building would remain intact as is. Um, and there would be requirements of sort of one modification of uh, one of the pocket doors off to the side. We would have to sort of um, alter that to be a, a swing door to allow for um, proper entrance into the building uh, that would be accessible. But essentially none of the other exterior architectural details would, would change. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, making some final um, uh, design landscape uh, to sort of integrate all of this into the landscape to uh, the tent would really be in position of the house, which really had the, the high ground on the site and provided all those important vistas down to Shovel Shop Pond and sort of across the landscape. And so that we would be preserving those vistas um, and sort of um, blending that in with a broader landscape with some additional plantings. Perfect. And team, just by way of uh, background, the um, initial letter of intent here is uh, has the trustees seeking $276,000 worth of CPA funding. That is part of a much larger um, total project cost of $753,000. So we would be a part in the trustees would be making a commitment to fundraise or outright fund the rest of the project. Is there any questions for Bob or Peter? Uh, Peter, thank you for joining as well. Meredith, go for it. Uh, just can you refresh my memory on, on the parking there for that property? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So as you know, there is the town holds a conservation restriction on the property, which limits a, a number of things um, in terms of our our um, reserve rights um, on the property. So there is a parking envelope sort of on the, um, up in the Northeast uh, corner there. It's about three quarters of an acre. And that is the only place that we can put a formal parking lot in. So we've uh, put uh, the initial uh, parking lot in which uh, accommodates about 21 cars at this point. Um, and part of our long terms, we're, we're looking at uh, possibly seeing if it's feasible to uh, get some additional parking in there. So we, at this point, we have 21 um, car uh, spaces uh, on an ongoing basis. So thank you. For, for some of our bigger events, you know, um, we would be looking at um, satellite parking uh, to bring things in, that, which, which is what we've done for the, some of the legacy um, events that we've uh, held on the property as well. Well, one of, one of the reasons I asked, obviously, in light of uh, the possibility for having events there, which I'm, a, you know, a big fan of, it's obviously is pretty spectacular property, um, is it's become the location for uh, uh, seniors to get their photographs taken there. And um, some, a friend of mine actually works over at 50 Oliver, and she said it was near impossible um, getting to work one day. Um, because that's the location where they go. So, you know, I wonder if it if it might behoove this project to, um, you know, if if I were building a, a commercial property anywhere in town, uh, first and foremost priority would be parking. Um, maybe Stephanie can speak to that potential of, you know, how many spaces could be added or where else that that you know could be 
be done because it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to be able to have some some real people come in and, and access it. Good point. Yeah, and, and maybe Wayne can speak a little bit to, to this because Wayne was actually working for the trustees uh, when this property was being um, acquired for its current purpose. And he and I worked closely together on this. I believe the parking area, um, it was, th this was kind of the initial phase and I believe there was consideration given maybe for future parking along the Elm Street and um, Oliver Street corner. But it was always um, part of the plan that for bigger events, the satellite parking would be what was used. So it sounds like the, the senior photos is kind of a one-off thing that it, people aren't thinking about what the impact of parking is on the neighborhood and maybe planning for um, satellite or shuttle parking. Right, I think it kind of just- At least at the, yeah. the time being. I yeah. think it just, it kind of leads to, you know, there's, there's a lot of people going there at once and there's inadequate parking. Right. Um, you know, my other concern would be, uh, one is handicap accessibility and two is the ability for uh, an ambulance or, or, or a fire truck to be able to get in there. And I do see those other, um, Eames Park Row, I think was one of them that I saw. Um, uh, you know, but in one small sense, I've been up there with my kids, they uh, sled there. Um, you know, and it's it's a long track to get from uh, the parking lot, if you will, you know, over to where the sledding hill is. It, just a consideration, just kind of thinking, you know, as we kind of look big picture here and attracting events, um, what we don't want to do is get that sort of negative feeling from the neighbors because their association is with picture day when their 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 area is burdened. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. I, I made the mistake of um, driving home one day uh, through there, and um, there were a lot of very happy, very well-dressed young people um, all <laughs> over everywhere. And I was like, this is a scene. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. It was actually really, really great, the energy. Um, but it, I'm sort of hearing maybe two things here. One, the trustees would be encouraged to look at senior picture day or opportunity or you know, week or what have you as an actual event. Yes. Uh, yeah. With like yeah. staff coordination um, and staff on hand to really help manage the crowds. Um, and then the second thing, and I, I believe Stephanie has uh, worked with the planning board on, on some other projects to do this um, for commercial properties that are contemplating, you know, valet or satellite parking options. Um, have those conversations now with potential uh, parking right. lot owners in the area and, you know, come forward with like, yes, we've actually talked to property owner X and they are open to a agreement for one-off events for, you know, leasing their lot at Y amount of money or something and have something kind of defined mm -hmm. to help address that. Ed, yeah. you've been patient. I just want to give Ed, he's holding up his hand before he gets tired. Go for it, Ed. So uh, I'm, I'm there every day, more than even the guys from the trustees, probably. Um, this is where I walk, and it's also where I fall down. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I did that uh, this winter, and uh, the fire department has no trouble getting a uh, engine and an ambulance all the way up to the main house. Um, and um, uh, they fished me out of the back and brought me up there and... Uh, so that's not an issue. I would hate to see uh, expanded parking in any of the green areas that you have here, because despite the fact that you might think that the property is large, it really isn't. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not sheep pasture. It's not uh, borderland. It's it's uh, the smallest of the really uh, excellent properties. Uh, I agree with Meredith, however, that um, uh, despite the fact that uh, the so-called senior pictures is really uh, pictures for the proms, which it's sort of like a flash mob. The kids do that themselves. Uh, scheduled pictures are either at Sheep Pasture or over in back of the library. So um, good luck controlling, controlling that. 
but the uh, parking lot itself, the 21 spaces, uh, does fill up with uh, with walkers, uh, 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 even on a on a um, normal weekend. <coughs> uh, the historical society has always allowed the uh, the trustees to use the uh, the parking space over there, uh, and I know they've parked at 50 Oliver Street. So I I think uh, Wayne's suggestion that we get that squared away in advance uh, would be uh, a good idea and. You know, not to bring up a yeah, sure. I'm going to bring up a sore spot. The uh, um, the area that's now the septic system in front of the historical society was supposed to be a parking space for the trustees, and so they lost a lot of spaces there. Okay. So if I could just respond there, I, okay. I it is our intention we will be going for, uh, before planning board for site plan review. So we are looking at um, seeing what we can do within the conservation restriction to expand the parking um, beyond what it currently is. Uh, we think we can get another 16 uh, parking lots within that um, parking envelope that would be allowed for. Um, so that might help with some of those um, sort of opportunities with that uh, sort of come like a senior picture, you know, so that would provide a little bit more uh, capacity. But most of our community events are, are really on weekends or evenings, uh, which is sort of opposite of some of the uh, peak business hours. And um, we feel that there would not be quite as much uh, conflict um, for those. And we have uh, reached out and begun to talk to some of the uh, property owners, um, and they seem amenable to, um, to working with us on that. John? Yeah, um, it, all my questions, concerns have been answered. I do have one, and um, why not uh, in tents, large tent pavilions that I've seen, you know, through the years, they're labor intensive, they need a lot of cleaning, um, damage, so forth, so forth. Why not put maybe a solid structure type pavilion that um, would not have those issues and it would look aesthetically far more beautiful. We, we went through the whole design process um, actually with, um, with a, uh, a school in, actually to look at a, a range of different options. We did look at a variety of uh, pavilion type things, uh, but we felt that um, the seasonal tent, so it will have a frame that will stay up throughout the year and then has a skin put on it um, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so we know we've done that at a number of our other properties. So we know what the maintenance uh, costs are to take it down clean it and properly store it and then uh, resurrect it. We think there are probably less long-term costs for maintaining that. I mean, we'll have to replace the sale. I mean, not the sale, but the um, skin, you know, I think every 15 years or, or so. Um, but it, it seems to be a little bit lighter on the landscape and uh, we think, uh, we think we've got a, a, a good one that will be uh, complementary to the landscape as well. Okay. Excellent. Any additional questions for Bob? <clears throat> Wayne? Thank you. Not necessarily directly related, but while we have you, Bob, um, the Historical Commission is beginning some questions, or some of the Historical Commission members have questioned uh, what's going on with what looks like uh, a car ran into the stone wall down there? At the oh, corner. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a big hole and a collapsed wall. That's right. So we ha had reached out to the police department to find out as well. And it looks like a, a car miss. I don't know if it was an animal trying to avoid an animal or something. But yeah, um, it was a, he tried to avoid a deer and hit the wall. He's yeah. a Coast Guard yeah. guy, so you should be able to track him down. Yes, I think we have the information and are working with the insurance company. So we're working on a repair of that and hope to restore that to its original condition. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. And since Wayne broke the seal on non-related items and you're here, <laughs> um, so blame Wayne. Any thoughts or updates or information to impart on that parcel of land that we work together right over the dam uh, that we've affectionately called the island? Um, any initial thoughts or anything with that parcel of property? I have a question for me. I'm, I'm afraid I, I have not. I am aware of um, 
th those talks and negotiations, um, but I am not familiar with the details of that, so I can't really speak to that, I'm afraid. Sure, no problem at all. Again, I blame Wayne for opening, <laughs> opening the door to other questions. So uh, anybody else have any questions on the topic uh, at hand regarding the carriage house and the support the trustees that they're looking for as it relates to this letter of interest? Hearing none, does anybody have any reservations about inviting the trustees to actually submit and work with us on an official application for their request? Hearing none. So Bob, uh, we uh, basically are using these letter of interest phases to meet with the people that are putting forth their requests and the organizations um, and appreciate you and Peter taking the time to do so today. It was nice to meet you even if by um, uh, virtually and I think you can probably tell by our questions and our concerns uh, how much we value the government yeah. state. Um, I have the good luxury of being just down the road as most of us are and get to walk it pretty regularly enough that I see Ed every two or three times that I go give or take. Um, and, and we love it. So we appreciate everything that you folks do. We look forward to working with you through the application process. Um, tonight isn't a yes on the deal. It's a yes to go to the application phase. Um, and we look forward to working with you once again to uh, see how we may be able to partner and bring another opportunity to the residents of Easton. Well, well thank you very much. We greatly appreciate your time and your consideration on this. Awesome. Bob, Peter, thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Next up, we have a discussion on the Swift Park design. For this discussion, just so folks know, uh, Ed will be recusing himself from debating or voting, I think. Ed, if I'm not misstating it. Yes. Um, uh, um, the, it's, a, it's a large and unique committee. And so uh, to look at all the legal questions of who could speak and who can't. John and I are the co-chairs, uh, and uh, we have several members of the committee, like uh, uh, Arlene Keach, who are uh, abutters and therefore have a, final, a financial interest in how it comes out. So no. we, got a, we got a ruling from the um, um, State Ethics Commission. I got a ruling. Uh, they, they only rule on individuals. And I, I am going to speak and make the presentation. Um, then um, uh, John uh, is not going to speak for the presentation, but he is able to uh, um, participate in, in answering questions and voting. Um, and of course, Stephanie has been working closely with us as well. So uh, she'll be available. This also differs a little bit from what we've been doing tonight in that we are, I think we are going to ask for um, some money um, uh, in, the, in the short run. So uh, is there any way we could get my favorite piece of property off of there? And let me see if I can do a screen share here. Certainly. So Ed, not to interject here. So Meredith is also on that committee. Oh yeah, that's right from the Recreation Commission. Thanks. You're banned I, too, so. I can't vote on it yet though because I haven't been sworn in. Oh, okay. If we were to do a vote, but I, I don't think we would anyway tonight. I need to get down to town hall. Oh, we're or wherever. Gonna... I don't even. Where am I supposed to go now to get sworn in? Town hall. Uh, town offices okay. to the clerk's office. Okay. All right. Let me get the. Oh, I see. Great. Hold on. Okay, can you all see that? Yep, perfect, Ed. Sure can. Okay. So we do have a request, and uh, I also want to take a minute. We only have 10 slides, trust me. I, I'm not going to be as long-winded as I can be. Um, and um, uh, basically, to refresh your memory, um, we have this idea to create a uh, expanded version of the uh, park that was established to honor um, Lawrence Swift, who uh, died uh, as a, a hospital orderly helping fight the flu epidemic of 1918. And we want to expand that to um, include uh, our first responders from the current pandemic and also victims of the, uh, that. And as we have discussed with uh, the folks, uh, it's sort of grown a little bit 
to also include um, an introduction to the important history of the area. Aside from Northeastern, there's probably more concentrated history in Furnace Village than any of the other of our important neighborhoods. So let me move on, maybe. Hmm. Stick with me. Oh, let's try this. Yeah. So a quick historical refresher. Swift Park's at the junction of Foundry and Paquanicut. Uh, it's about a third of an acre. And the, uh, the original name comes from the fact that in uh, 1752, a foundry and blast furnace was put in there that made cannons and cannonballs for the, uh, for the Revolutionary War. Uh, in uh, the 1890s, the foundry building uh, up here was bought by two brothers who ran a general store there for a number of years. And one of their sons was the Lawrence Swift that the park is named after. And then finally, uh, uh, in September 1934, two granddaughters of the original foundry owners um, donated the land to the town for park purposes. So the select board uh, started a, a, a very large committee um, in December of uh, last year, and we were charged to define the purpose uh, of the park and we've accomplished that. Uh, uh, oversee development of, of park design, which is kind of where we're at right now. And then finally, to advance park construction for uh, the 2025 tricentennial. And um, just speaking quickly about the 2025 uh, tricentennial, everybody remembers the great big parades we had at our 250th anniversary and 270th and 75th anniversary. Uh, but uh, those events also included some lasting things like um, bicycle paths and other permanent uh, uh, additions to um, the amenities of the town. So it, uh, it, the park construction sort of fits in. So the progress so far, the, uh, the um, um, subcommittee uh, what has been trying to uh, harmonize their design ideas. You imagine with 11 people, we had a lot of ideas. Uh, so that we could submit um, something coherent to a professional developer. Uh, and uh, we checked with the town engineer and town council. Um, the green space is absolutely positively town property um, and for park purposes only. But um, uh, the town engineer, Greg Swan, uh, recommended uh, surveying the, the edges of the property uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, there are a lot of easements and rights of way on the edges uh, that need to be clarified. And second of all, we want to clarify uh, the parking space for, uh, for the building uh, that's next to it. So we, we don't want to cut off those parking spaces. So um, we're looking for a, a survey. More on that in a minute. Right now, actually. So uh, we're going to suggest to you two options. Number one, option is the one that uh, the subcommittee favors. Uh, and uh, basically what we'd like to do is uh, right now in 2022, immediately use administrative fund uh, uh, money to uh, uh, begin a, a survey, uh, to do the survey and uh, do preliminary design work. So uh, what we're proposing is that the planning department has $10,000 in consulting funds that could be used for this project. And we're recommending the use of $25,000 of CPA funds um, to um, um, go forward. Uh, we estimate that the uh, survey would cost about $5,000, leaving $30,000 for preliminary design work so that we could do more public outreach uh, if you remember the Rockery project, there was a, a, a charrette where uh, public uh, opinion was sought. Uh, we want to uh, be very mindful of what the cost of the final design and, um, and uh, construction are, are going to be. And we figure the amount that we're asking for would get us to, um, to know how much that final design document would cost and also give us an idea of how much it's going to cost to construct a thing. Uh, part two then would be um, 
uh, this is the other reason that I'm here tonight, would be a, uh, a regular CPA request for town meeting 2023, and that would be for the final design work, okay? So the benefit of this is that uh, it gets us going right now. We're ready to, to move ahead. Um, and uh, the other thing is we're trying to be responsible for the costs. So moving on. The other option uh, is that we could uh, simply wait until next year and roll all this up into a um, uh, CPA request, which would include a full site survey. It would um, give us you know, design documents, construction documents, and bid documents, all of that stuff. But we would have to wait until next year to really get started on that. So the drawbacks that we see and why we're recommending option one is that um, um, we won't get the planning uh, department consultation funding. Um, we'd have less chance for public engagement because we'd be rushing to get the project done. Uh, and we'd have a less uh, accurate cost estimate for the request that we're gonna make you know, in the fall. And then finally, notice the, the stars here. Phase three would be, uh, would be funding of the construction phase. And um, uh, John and I both agree that we wanna get to a really solid design before we go out and solicit money from the community to try to reduce the cost of uh, the construction phase. So that would be um, a, another request to CPA, uh, fundraising on the part of the committee uh, with approval by the uh, town meeting for May, 2024 and the park would be complete by um, 2025. So we have a bunch of working design ideas. Uh, we wanna try to save the trees on the property if we can, there's a couple that are bad. Uh, we're gonna have to regrade the property uh, to some extent to meet ADA requirements, um, perhaps a, a two level plan with a, with a ramp to uh, reduce grading might work. Um, we have agreed that the, the memorial, we've agreed on what the memorial should be made of, but not what it's gonna look like yet. Um, so granite or concrete, depending on costs. Um, the general trend is towards a wall. Um, an obelisk is a possibility or a bowl, and we'll, I'll show you that in a minute. And we would like the memorial to include a, um, a water feature, probably a water wall feature. Uh, which is the easiest uh, moving water feature to maintain. Um, we also have sort of agreed that uh, we want to include uh, laser engraved pictures. I'm trying to get a, a photographer to uh, pose a picture of first responders so we have one big picture and that would save us money because laser engraving is, expense, is expensive uh, and um, we have other ideas for other engravings. Um, and the next thing is that other idea. Uh, the people in the neighborhood want to have a few markers uh, that start um, uh, in the corner nearest the car dealership and work their way up the hill to where the monument would be. Um, and um, it would have uh, a, a timeline of the events of, uh, of, uh, of the neighborhood. Um, not only did uh, cannonballs get, uh, get made for the Revolutionary War, but uh, machine parts for the, the textile mills in, in Lowell uh, were made there as well. So they have a, a role in the Industrial Revolution as well. Uh, and then uh, along that uh, uh, timeline, we're, uh, we're going to uh, uh, hopefully put in stone walls uh, instead of benches and flowering trees uh, and shrubs. Uh, right now we're considering a small shelter and a, a Again, word, word choice matters. We're talking about, you know, we, we've been talking about a pavilion, but we really want something relatively small, um, smaller than the wonderful pavilion that's at Frothingham now, but of similar style, something that would actually fit into the neighborhood. And I have a couple of examples I'll show you in a second. We want a drinking fountain for people and dogs and maybe an air pump for bicycles. Uh, and uh, one of the things that John is always, um, concerned about is uh, maintenance. So we want to consider uh, irrigation on the site. Uh, lighting is still under discussion for the memorial, uh, but we want period lighting for the site. And then another idea would be to have a 
um, tasteful, I guess. Welcome, uh, east, w welcome to Easton sign at the west end of the property because um, it's a major thoroughfare that brings people into town. So this is the site. These are the trees that we're looking at. Uh, the one to the extreme right, the little tree, is a, is a nice crab apple, which is beautiful in the spring. Um, there are two uh, dawn redwoods on the property. This uh, one right in the center of the picture uh, is, is one of them. Uh, dawn redwoods are still relatively rare here in the, um, in the state. Um, one of the very first ones in the entire country was actually planted at uh, the Governor Ames estate. Uh, and they've added a couple more recently. This one was put in by the Garden Club. And then uh, there are maple trees or oak trees that may have to come down simply because, as you can see, the, the shape has been distorted from branches falling off and stuff like that. So an idea that came up uh, is uh, Maya Lin, the lady that did the... Uh, um, Vietnam Memorial, the original Vietnam Memorial, and many other memorials since then, did a thing in Newport in a very small park, uh, which is called the Meeting Room. And the historical trope there was that there were three buildings there, one in the 18th, one in the 19th, and one in the 20th century, um, that were dug up by archaeologists. So her idea was to put the walls back, use them as benches, uh, and we kind of like that idea, and that's the direction we're looking at right now. Uh, the, the fireplace one, it's not a real fireplace, but um, we had a blast furnace. So uh, may, maybe put the blast furnace back in there as a, as a, as a stone feature. Water walls, um, this, they can be very skinny. Uh, they can be very large. Uh, they work very well with uh, uh, names or, or engravings because it makes the water uh, makes the water bubble. And then the one down below is another Maya Lin project uh, where the water bubbles up out of that little uh, stone in the center, hole in the center, and then flows over the, over the side. And there's an inscription. It's actually a circular timeline. Um, the Korean War Memorial is uh, is uh, laser engraved. Uh, and you can see you can see faces of, of people. Supposedly, every unit that fought in the war uh, is there. And if you can find a park ranger, he can point out where Douglas MacArthur is because the soldiers made sure he was the smallest guy on the whole thing. Uh, and then down below is a uh, is a little dog memorial. It's uh, but it's a very small um, thing that we think we might be able to use for the for the timeline events. Uh, also laser engraved and so it wouldn't have a you wouldn't it wouldn't be like at the governor Ames estate where you have those big things sticking up uh, with with pictures on it would be a little more a little more subtle a little more 18th century uh, and um, and that's it let's see one more slide I believe and that's this is what a blast furnace looks like uh, and then that's the kiosk at, uh, or, or uh, pavilion at Frothingham Park. And this is a, at a, this is a lean-to shed uh, up at um, a park in the Adirondacks. So we'll, if we put a shelter in, we're looking for something that would look rustic and, and 18th century blast furnace-ish. So that's, that's that. We're therefore asking you to say, Go ahead and get ready for a big presentation, and here's $25,000 to, to do that. So we do require a vote tonight or discussion. And at this point, I get to go and watch the football game. So uh, we'll see you guys. <laughs> You're joking, uh, right, Ed? Uh, well, at the football game's been on the whole, the whole time we've been meeting. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I can answer this, questions this about the presentation, but I can't Oh, deliver. that's right, because you're not deliberating. Yeah, um, I and I just, I, just want, I just want to make it clear that the, um, when Ed says we're looking for funds, they're looking for funds tonight. It's administrative funds, which yes. can be voted on by the board outside of um, town meeting and can be used for planning for pro upcoming or um, anticipated projects. 
And I do want to take a moment, team. Uh, so, Ed, I appreciate you raising this to Stephanie. Uh, what I do want to make sure we all understand, and something from my perspective as chair, is I would not want the just raising of using administrative funds to be done unless it was an agenda item. I believe firmly and passionately that the public should know that they should have an opportunity to understand where we're allocating our funds, particularly when it's a project that will have a follow on ask of the public themselves. Because in essence, this is us in part committing ourselves to this project in their support. So nothing untoward uh, at all, and I don't mean to indicate that in any way, Stephanie's 100% accurate and add again, kudos to you for raising it and, and to the team for raising it. I just wanna make sure everybody knows that uh, it would not be okay to arrive here without it being an agenda item so that we could have a broader audience attend if they so wanted to. So anybody have questions for Ed as presenter of the particular project and then the request and support I think it's $25,000 now, but then it would be, I think the ask in total was 60,000. So it would be an additional $25,000 in the future, given the difference would be made up by $10,000 from the planning budget, I guess is the yes. right way to say it. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. yes. All right, so this is a, a yes, it would be a, a yes now, and then therefore an implied yes of our support in the future. Um, and I do want to give time in case anybody has questions for Ed. I think we're all pretty familiar with the project. No questions. All right. I have one. Um, oh. Just interested, the water wall kind of uh, in, a, in an area of drought and probably prolonged drought due to climate change, is that really the best idea for east and water resources? Well, I think the bigger problem would be the uh, would be, be the irrigation. To tell you the truth, the uh, like our car wash and our, our laundromat, the water and the fountain would be recycled, whereas the irrigation water is expended and goes back in the water table sometime, you know, fifty years from now. Uh, right. But yeah, the, uh, it's also the the water wall feature, and and there was discussion <clears throat> about a a. a bigger and bubblier fountain uh, is the is the most water saving feature. And and Ed, you also said it is the least um, high high um, Yeah, it's very need, low maintenance. Low maintenance. It, it's very low maintenance compared to the other types of water fountains. The other point you brought up, Al, um, and Ed about the landscaping and irrigation i mean that's something that's a really good point and as we go through the public input process and really refine the project is looking at maybe some type of zero scape landscaping as well low um you know drought resist resistant plant matter um and, and things there's been some research recently uh that says that once you establish a native new england plant uh, they're used to these droughts. Um, whether they're going to be used to the droughts with climate change is, is another question. But um, I, I, I don't think I don't think we're going to have to plant cactus. But um, and, and that and that's another reason for working. I mean, when we talk about working with a consultant on the design, the idea is to work with um, an experienced landscape architect firm that should be, um, and that can be one of the things we look for when we're selecting that firm is their experience um, and knowledge about adapting uh, plant materials uh, that are um, adaptive to the changes in climate that we're anticipating. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Albert, you brought up a good question and that will be addressed, hopefully it was. Sure. Uh, excuse me for my voice. <clears throat> We, so, any other questions? When the committee uh, when the committee got together, um, we wanted to do something because there's nothing in that area of town, and we wanted to do it on a, on a classy, grandiose um, presentation. And we don't have anything of a water feature in town at all that I know of. 
uh, other than I think maybe we've got a small one or we have a, no, we have a bubbler. I think at that one on Center Street, I think that's the- Yes, we have a bubbler there, yep. Yeah, uh, but there's no water features. So we've that's- managed, We've managed to talk John down from grandiose, uh, but- <laughs> The people, the, the people in the district want um, a water feature because water played such an important part in the mills and factories in, in the area. So, that so was- let me clarify when I said grandiose. When Stephanie and, and um, our town administrator approached Ed and I uh, about a year and a half ago about this idea that we were all in agreement that we didn't want to do just some type of a marker and a park bench and a couple of shrubs that if we're going to dedicate this, rededicate this specifically in this area, as Ed had uh, so eloquently stated in his presentation, that incorporate the history and the two pandemics in what a great spot. It doesn't look very big when you're driving by, but it's actually a good piece of land, specifically, as Ed mentioned, uh, that northern boundary, which we have to clarify. We didn't touch base a little bit on that we're, we've got some ideas and we don't know how far this is going to go about maybe trying to figure out a way to get to Old Pond, New Pond. Um, yeah, because the, uh, the Bay Circuit Trail works. comes down that yeah. way. And uh, if we could tie that in, we, we had a, a huge debate over which side of the street to put the sidewalk in. And before we realized that our charge had nothing to do with sidewalks. So. So we're going to recommend that the uh, there's a, a very strong and has been for decades a very strong community feeling there, and we're going to recommend to our committee members that they get their local group together to have input on uh, issues like the sidewalks and things. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't think we have any questions or thoughts or concerns about this project going past a letter of intent into a uh, letter of interest going into an application phase. Um, I will certainly um, look at now having a debate and discussion about the use of administrative funds uh, okay, as requested. Does could I get have... muted here, please? Sure. Can somebody mute Ed? I, I'll mute myself, but I... But I... Sure. There you go, Ed. Um, so does anybody have any questions? So this is where Ed will, will exit while we debate. Have any questions or concerns or thoughts about using administrative funds in this way to help support this project and get it off the ground in a more expeditious manner, enabling the achievement of some of the deadlines that they put forth? Just, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing what the, the total level of administrative funds are so that you can uh, take a look at that in percentage terms. So that's, that's a great question, Al. Um, at, there is $50,000 available for this year. So every year, a percentage of the CPA funds that are collected for the town um, is set aside for administration. Some of that pays for some of the administrative cost. And there's $50,000 available for other projects. We're asking for 25,000 because that um, seems appropriate for the work that needs to be done um, and will really get us um, well into the way of design. Also, it leaves 25,000 if other um, uses come up for the board's attention. So for example, if another parcel of land that the CPC was interested in considering purchasing for the town or, or advancing to town meeting came up and the board wanted to get an appraisal, you would use your administrative funds to pay for those expenses. So it leaves enough money to cover those um, unanticipated uh, but necessary, potentially necessary expenses. Thank you. Good question, Al. Do you know how much we used last year, Stephanie? Uh, uh, outside of the normal um, funds that are used for administ general administrative ongoing annual purposes, I think it was just the 5,000, Wayne, for the Pond Street appraisal. Yeah, I think it was like four or something. Yeah, I, I was... Yeah. being conservative with a yeah. high number. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that was, that was it. Okay. 
Does anybody have any other questions, thoughts, concerns? Okay, hearing none, if somebody would like to make a motion to utilize $25,000 of our administrative funds as identified in the presentation given by Mr. Hands in order to facilitate us achieving or them achieving the deadlines um, and goals that they had set forth. So moved, Lee. Second, Sheedy. So that's Lee and Sheedy. And I'll just go around the dial. Uh, John Ventresco. Aye. Al Benson. It's frozen. Meredith Keach. Aye. Dennis Sheedy. Aye. Jim Lee. Aye. Amanda Varela. Aye. Tom Broussard is an aye. And I'll circle back one last time to Al Benson. Still frozen. Aye. So, oh, I, we heard an aye. Aye. Perfect. Hi, Al. Um, good. So it passes unanimously. Um, thank you, Ed, uh, for A, doing it the right way, researching the ethics uh, commission question. John, thank you uh, to both of you for all of your efforts on that committee. And please pass along our best and support for all those folks that are contributing their time to it. And Meredith, I'm sure you'll be on there soon. Just uh, just using my psychic powers. One thing I forgot to uh, forgot to mention related to administrative funds is that it doesn't roll over from year to year. So if you don't spend this year's stuff, it goes back into the general fund. Not that that's a bad thing, but we're saving taxpayers money. But we can't build up a war chest uh, of administrative funds. Absolutely. Well said. So that concludes the letter of interest phase of tonight. We have a couple other housekeeping items that I expect will go pretty fast. So I thank you all for your time. It has been an hour and a half. First up, just the FY23 Community Preservation Coalition membership dues. Stephanie, could, do you mind giving us just a, a brief update on this? I think this is something that we did last year. It's appropriate for us to do again. It, I, it's like, something the board has done, I, I believe, every year. Um, and um, there may have been one year where the dues weren't paid. And frequently we're asked what's the benefit that we derive. The most importantly, I think, is that the coalition actually does all the lobbying at the state house and the legislature uh, for additional funding. And I did send around an email. I, I haven't sent around the update to the email. I think it was an additional I want to say $80 million that was included in the bond, uh, the econ economic development bond bill, the, the governor's, um, the, the budget um, that was there because of the lobbying efforts of the coalition. That was taken out of the budget by the governor and it didn't make its way back in, but the coalition was there lobbying when it went back to the legislators. Um, Again, try, trying to push them to get that money back in. So when you see those extra dollars every year, in part, that is a result of the lobbying efforts of the coalition. The coalition also answers questions for us. When we have a question about a project and whether it's eligible or not, uh, they're our first source we go to. They maintain the full state database of projects that have been funded with CPA funds by the community. Um, we use that database extensively preparing for uh, this past spring fall meeting um, just to go back and document all the projects that CPA, um, Easton CPA has funded over the, um, over the time period since the town voted to adopt CPA. So um, they are a valuable resource. Yeah, I second that. If you haven't gone to their website, it's a wealth of information, not just in our community, every community of all projects that have been completed. They have an incredible data bank. They have incredible resources that we could avail ourselves of, trainings that I know that they've offered, um, and they are incredible advocates on our collective behalf. Um, yeah. Stephanie, what's the amount of the dues? I. You know, I am sorry, Tom. I don't have that at my fingertips. I meant to get that invoice and have it on hand. I believe it's between $2,500 and $3,000. I think that's fair to give people a context 
Um, for a quick moment there, I was afraid you were going to say 25,000. And no, no, funds, no, no, not these funds come out of? They would come out of your administrative funds. Got it. So of the 25,000 we have roughly remaining, this would be an additional 2,500 to 3,500 using round numbers uh, that we would be allocating for this, uh, what I would consider important membership. Yes. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, or concerns? Do you know what the coalition, uh, co what their stand is on 40 Bs? <laughs> I, yeah, just we, had to get I know the coalition. <laughs> I know the coalition because one of the um, categories of funding for that can be um, one of the categories of projects that CPA funds can be used for is community housing, which translates to affordable housing, that they are in support of affordable housing and construction of affordable housing. That's what I that's what I can tell you. So Thank if, you. if I could channel our dear departed Lee Williams, that was his main objection to the coalition. And it's should be the main objection to any lobbying group. Once you pay a lobbying group to lobby for you, they might not lobby in the way that you want them to lobby. And that was Lee's issue with uh, with 40B. Uh, I think it's a wonderful expenditure of our funds, to tell you the truth, despite their stand on 40B, which is a law that needs a lot of revision. But uh, I'm 100 percent in favor of voting for this. I would make the motion to spend that money. Second. So that's Lee and Francesco going around the horn at hands. Aye. John Francesco? Aye. Al Benson? Aye. Meredith Peach? Aye. Dennis Sheedy? Aye. Stephanie Daniel? Uh, no, nope, you don't get to. Sorry. Jim Lee? Aye. Amanda Varela? Aye. And Tom Broussard is not. That's unanimous. Um, I feel like show that Jim actually voted twice, but that's that's true by putting it forth. But that's okay. Um, next up, just an update on the in-person board meetings, remote meetings. I think, as we all know, it's been extended through March thirty-first, twenty twenty-three. Stephanie, I looked in preparation for this particular line item as to whether or not it enabled hybrid meetings so that people could attend virtually or in person. It does, but we still do not have the ability to um, easily do that, to easily accommodate. The town does not have the um, technology at the moment to easily accommodate hybrid. Got it. So what I'm going to do, I, I am keeping in mind that we have people on our committee that are sensitive to group gatherings. Um, I do want to have the Oak Kings Memorial Hall discussion when we come to it in person to enable inclusion of people from the community so that we can meet in person I think um, as long as we found appropriate, very large venues that the people on the committee felt that would be a good accommodation, um, I'd love to offer the hybrid and I will certainly research that, but would everybody be amenable to a large location with a lot of uh, space in between for an in-person meeting for the Oak Saints Memorial Hall? Otherwise, I think we we are doing very well with these remote meetings. I think it works for people. Um, and we have pretty good attendance as evidenced by participants for the letters of interest phase. But does an in-person meeting for the hall at the right place make sense for people? I'm fine with it as long as it's not at the Corona meeting room. That's too small for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll send around a, a primary recommendation location and then a secondary just in case. Uh, Stephanie, if I could just ask you and Wayne to kind of bird dog that for options for us. Yep. And let me know what we could then reserve um, for September. And then that way, I think we can get some good communication out, let people know that we'll have this discussion. And Ed, yes, sir. Um, two things, number one, um, the genealogy club that I belong to meets at Quisset House, which is too small, but we have gone to a hybrid meeting and all you need to is to have a Wi-Fi hookup for a computer and you can run Zoom, et cetera, through that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, based on what I heard last night uh, at uh, Oak Sam's Hall, 
we might actually be able to have the meeting at the hall. And On September 8th? Yeah. They're, they're, no. They're, no. They, <laughs> Fred seemed very optimistic. So if, if not, then the other choice would be Frothingham Hall, but that might be if, small for Amanda. I think, I, I think the Simmons Hall is generally open. I believe, Amanda, you indicated you thought that would be fine. So I think that might be the first place we look. Let's pray it's not 90 degrees because it's not air conditioned. Oh, it's not air. Okay. But I would think September, hopefully it's not, but to your point, Ed, this is a crazy Okay, so we'll times. So check for the Is Simmons anywhere Hall. we meet air conditioned properly. I don't I no. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be what, in a, what about a um well ventilated hot room than a Amanda, uh, what about Frothingham? That's what I was gonna think. Where in the it's in a the, little in the, gym? in the in the in the yes, in the gym area. The the I mean, it's I don't better mean, than town hall. It's better than town hall. It's not a and, and it has higher no well, I don't know that it has higher ceilings. It's a little area, but it's it's not a lot bigger. How about if we, Stephanie, if that's all right, on behalf of yeah, the team, if I could just ask yeah. you and Wayne to come up with yeah. a we'll, recommendation, we'll, yes. we'll yeah. bet, and then we'll circulate it for the team. Yeah. And the benefit of doing it at the high school is that they probably have 411 uh, air purifiers there as well to facilitate yes. additional ventilation yeah. that we'll you may not be at the other locations. Yeah. Um, Next up is the Oak Sands Memorial Hall Technical Review Committee. So no update other than Ed was the only person who submitted a request to join from the historical perspective in terms of the outdoors. So Ed, thank you for volunteering, sir. The If Stephanie, you or Wayne could forward to Ed the invite for the August 22nd meeting, which I believe Ed is at 3.30 in the afternoon. Sounds good. And thank you for that. Um, I... September 8th, we talked about, uh, out of order, my bad. Items not reasonably anticipated by the chair. I don't have any, and I don't have any reason for a possible executive session. So unless anybody else has any business they'd like to discuss, well, once again, thank you all for your time. Really appreciate you guys giving to the town and to our committee specifically. And I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. But that's Hans and Francesco, and I'll go around the horn. Uh, Ed? Yes. John? Yes. Al? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Jim? Yes. Amanda? Yes. And Tom is an I as well. I hope you all have a great remainder to the rest of the summer. I would enjoy 80 degree days all day long, given how fun today was. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you folks beginning in September. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.